the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, when we grew up, if we went to Sunday school, we saw the wonderful children's stories about Noah's Ark and the cute animals coming into the ark and all the pastel colors and it was so nice and beautiful but if you really stop to think about what it was like in that ark i mean can you imagine the sounds the noises the smells uh it must have been quite an experience wildlife indeed I wonder if you saw that news story, it was pretty grisly last week, about the lion that mauled the suspected poacher uh, near a uh, national park in South Africa. They found a few bits and pieces left and they realized this guy was trying to kill these wild animals and turn it around, I guess. He was eaten by a pack of lions. You gotta wonder how Noah managed that whole assemblage of animals in the ark, divinely, I would suspect. Something jumped out at me when I reread Genesis 9, which we just heard, and maybe it did for you too. Now, the ark had landed on dry land after 40 days and 40 nights, which in Hebrew means a very long time. And God tells Noah and his sons, as for me, I am establishing my covenant my agreement, my promise with you and your descendants after you. Okay, that makes sense. God making a covenant with humankind, one of many that God makes in the Bible. All good. But then God goes on. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you. Huh. So the covenant with God that God is making here is not just with humans, but with all the animals. I establish my covenant with you, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God promises to every living creature never to do that judging thing with water again. And God doesn't say that just once. I don't know if you noticed God reiterates the fact that he's making this covenant not just with human beings, but with the animals five times in that little passage in Genesis. God doesn't want us to miss that. Uh, so this covenant is made between God and every human and every living creature. I will remember my covenant. I will see the rainbow and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. On and on, God says this. He just doesn't want us to miss this covenant. Now, by the way, this is no extra charge, but one <laughs> question that preachers and theologians often get is, you know, will my dog, my cat, my beloved cockatiel be in heaven? Well, I think, what do you think? God is making a covenant with all the animals here. And in Revelation chapter 5, by the way, you see in heaven, all living creatures are praising God. Hmm. So I would say, yes. <laughs> Don't quote. <laughs> Wild or domesticated animals are part of God's creation and clearly have a place in God's heart. Now, hold on to that as we jump to the gospel in Mark chapter 1, where Mark, here in just a very few verses, covers three big events like bullet points. It's almost like a PowerPoint presentation slide of the first milestones of Jesus' early ministry. First, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan, and note that a voice comes from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. So comforting. I just want to rest in that affirming, you know, God loves me, cares for me. I'm beloved. I'm well pleased. At least I hope so. 
And you just want to rest in that divine affirmation. Unfortunately, Mark then says, and the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the Son of God, beloved, well-pleasing. And then suddenly God's Spirit thrusts him out into the wilderness with the wild beasts. That doesn't sound very comforting <laughs> after all. But maybe Jesus needed that affirmation from God the Father in order to get through these 40 days of temptation and trial. And maybe we all need that affirmation ringing in our ears as we go forth into our own life's wilderness. The tough financial situation, the health fears, the flu going around, the relationship pain, the big decisions we have to make. The latest school shooting that is so heavy on our hearts. We're in the wilderness with wild beasts. So, when you find yourself there, hear God saying to you, You are my child, my <clears throat> beloved one. Keep that reality in your hearts as you live in the wilderness. Because, as with Jesus, angels can come and wait on you minister to you. Well, after his time in the wilderness, Mark tells us in yet another PowerPoint bullet point, Jesus comes to Galilee after John the Baptist's arrest and he <coughs> proclaims the good news of God. The time is fulfilled. It is now. Are you ready? The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So Jesus Listen to God in the wilderness. God's angels were there waiting on him. And that equipped him to fulfill his calling, which will take him and us to the cross and the tomb and the resurrection at Easter. Now, I have a feeling, and I, I can't prove this, and it's hard to tell in Mark's brief report, but... When Jesus was in the wilderness, it says he was with the wild beast. It doesn't say what happened. And maybe the beasts knew who he was. After all, remember God had made that covenant with all the animals, including the wild beasts. Yes, he was in the wilderness with the wild beasts, but the angels were also waiting on him. Now, he's the Son of God. We are not God. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, so I don't know if, if I would try that <laughs> yourself. But still, it's kind of interesting to consider. I read a news story from British Columbia, Canada, about a family who had a beloved golden retriever. And the son of the family, 11-year-old Austin Foreman, was out in the backyard putting some logs in a wheelbarrow for the fireplace one evening. And he noticed his dog, this beloved golden retriever, starts barking furiously as he's pushing that wheelbarrow back to his house. And he said he was almost to the door when, horrified, he saw his dog charging across the yard and attacking this cougar who was bounding toward Austin, who's saving Austin's life. The animals fought. They were rolling around together. They rolled under the porch of the house. Austin was safely inside now. His mom called 911, and a Royal Canadian Mounted Constable close by raced over, not on horseback. <laughs> he had a flashlight in one hand and a gun in the other, and he peered under that porch as those two animals were still at each other. The, the cougar was gnawing at the dog's neck, and the officer shot the wild cougar. Well, the beloved pet was badly injured and had to have a good deal of surgery and many stitches, but he recovered. Now, guess what that, got, that, that dog's name was? angel. Oh. Really? <clears throat> One way or another, as with Austin Foreman and with Jesus, angels can wait on us. 
And you notice there are a lot of 40s in these readings. Noah's Ark, 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. And now we are in a season of Lent, 40 days plus Sundays. And trust me, we will be tempted and tested in the wilderness of our lives during these next several weeks. Hopefully not as dramatically as Jesus was as he fasted in the wilderness with the wild beasts. But who do we listen to in the wilderness of life? Do we hear only the wild beasts growling and shrieking and yakking and barking at us? Or do we hear those angels who are around us waiting upon us just as they waited on Jesus? Beloved, this is what Lent is for. To encourage us to stop, to listen to God, to soak in God's word, to pray, to focus intently on our spiritual walk with God. So that we too, when we find ourselves in those wilderness places, can be waited on by angels. Amen. Amen.